This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are discussing with Paul Kingor, a new book he has co-edited with Jeffrey L. Chittister, Reagan's Legacy and a World Transformed. Paul Kingor has published extensively on Ronald Reagan, two books I'll mention, God and Ronald Reagan and The Crusader, Ronald Reagan and the Fall of Communism. Both, both books form the basis for a new movie to come out called Reagan the Movie. Paul, welcome to the program. Thank you, Richard. Good to be with you. So in this book, Reagan's Legacy in a World Transformed, it features a, a lot of different contributors and a, a lot of essays in various areas um, that that you know, shaped Ronald Reagan's presidency and that also have served to shape the, the, the post-Reagan world, if you will. We've got uh, Ronald Reagan confronting the Soviet Union, obviously. We've got Reagan's legacy with regard to free trade and globalism, foreign policy, uh, terrorism policy, nuclear arms. Uh, not a lot of writing about Ronald Reagan and the conservative movement. And I also didn't see a lot of, a lot of writing about supply-side economics, which seems to me a crucial part of Reagan's legacy. So those will be some things that we can discuss. But I, I want to start with the current president, who I think largely and indeed said, uh, while he admired Reagan, uh, he admired him for his dynamic, transformative capabilities. But President Obama also wanted uh, or also wants to transform America. And I think uh, a part of that is that this president believes Reagan's transformation uh, was a false transformation and that, it was, that it's been built on um, uh, credulity and deceit and, and something that is uh, not quite consistent with American values. And so Obama thought that he had to undo or thinks he has to undo Reagan's legacy here. Uh, and, yet, and yet we've seen uh, a great amount of resistance uh, to this president's agenda, even though he succeeded, obviously, with Obamacare and Dodd-Frank. But to my mind, it speaks to a certain amount of durability of what Reagan accomplished. What do you think? Yeah, no, no, I agree with that. I mean, look, when, when Barack Obama, I mean, Reagan was a transformative leader, but, you know, really in a more mild, um, you know, albeit inspiring way. You know, when, when Obama talked about fundamental transformation, right, I mean, he really, he really he, he wanted to... A- yeah, he wanted to fundamentally transform America, and still, still to this day, uh, I sit in amazement as I just watch the people kind of blindly clapping behind Obama uh, as he says that back in 2008. You know, we were just days away from fundamentally transforming America. I mean, fundamental transformations are major, major changes. You know, R- Ronald Reagan wanted to, wanted to go back to the founding to take America back to those, those time-tested ideas and principles. Uh, you know, you, your show is about liberty, I think, of Russell Kirk and ordered liberty, you know, internal order, external order. You know, Ray, you know, Reagan, as a conservative, believed in, in those ideas and values from the founding in American history that were worth conserving and preserving and, and really resurrecting. But you know, Obama, Obama is a progressive, and progressives believe, and they, they don't believe in, in a system of set absolutes, fixed ideas, and timeless principles. They believe that you're always progressing to new truths, new ideas. You can transform the understanding of life itself. You know, talk, uh, Justice Kennedy in his famous mystery clause in, in Casey versus Planned Parenthood in 1992 where he said at the heart of liberty in America is the right to come up with your own idea, ideas of existence, of life, of meaning itself. Yeah, so they believe that you can, that you can redefine things like marriage. You know, no, no, no problem with that. Uh, Ronald Reagan, on the other hand, he, he didn't believe that. He wanted to go back to, to those eternal principles, those, those first principles. So it's a very different thing, and, and really Obama, by wanting to tap into Reagan, what he really wants to do is wanted to do is tap into Reagan's success. You know that that's what he wanted to emulate, but but he wanted to do it in a in a totally different direction than Ronald Reagan would have ever supported or probably even imagined. Well, there are so many things that come into my mind listening to you talk. You know, one you know someone said to me, uh, just sort of filling out. Uh, the question I asked you, 
uh, Obama thought that he had to replace Reagan, and he had to show that Reagan's economic growth uh, was a false growth and that it was built on inequity, that it was built on um, uh, fat profits for those at the top, and it fundamentally uh, you know, shook down the middle class. I, I think the other side of that is, as conservatives, perhaps we had to, ha- or the country as a whole, needed to watch a progressive president implement his policies and watch them fail. That in, in a way, that was the only way people could learn that what Reagan had tried to achieve uh, actually was good uh, and enduring and, and should be recovered. Well, yeah, and you had mentioned earlier, Richard, about supply-side economics. I mean, look, when it comes to the differences in economic philosophy, Reagan, of course, the, the centerpiece of his program was to take the upper-income marginal tax rates, which were 70 percent, and he eventually cut them down to 28 percent. And In fact, his, his August 1981 signing of the Economic Recovery Act at, at the Reagan Ranch in, in near Santa Barbara, Reagan cut taxes across the board 25 percent on all income groups. And when Reagan started the presidency in 1981, there were 14 or 16, I forget exactly what it is, different tax brackets. By the time he was done, there were only two, 28% and 15%. You know, Reagan, Reagan cut tax rates on, on, on everybody. And, and I mention all of this because Obama, remember the big debate in 2011, 2012, uh, after the Republican Congress took over, about whether or not to further extend the Bush tax cuts. And, and, and Bush had taken that top rate, which at that point had crept back up to 39.6%. Bush had brought it down to 36%. And, and, and Obama did not, want to, <laughs> he did not want to continue that 36% rate. He wanted to take it back up. And I'll never forget that, that bitter press conference, and he was bitter, where, where he's talking to the media, and, he, and he's almost snarling and reprimanding his fellow liberals in the media, and, and, and he's trying to explain to them that he had no choice but, but to retain the Bush tax cuts because of what he called these hostage takers, unquote, uh, John Boehner and the Republicans. And he said, look, to these people, tax cuts for the wealthy are their holy grail. That's what he said, their, their holy grail. And he said this in such a contemptuous way, their holy grail, right? <laughs> well, yeah, well yeah, that's, you know, to Reagan, tax cuts was the centerpiece of what he wanted to do. And, and, and so, you know, that, that was, I guess, Obama would, would have considered that Reagan's holy grail. And by the way, I would add here, if, if tax cuts are, are indeed the conservatives' holy grail, and I think that's overdoing it, well, well the, the progressive <laughs> income tax is indeed liberalism's holy grail. I mean, when that thing was implemented in 1913, I think there are liberals who would be willing to die for the progressive income tax. I mean, they love that thing. They absolutely, they talk of that thing like, it was, like it's etched in the Liberty Bell, yeah. like, like, like it was part of the Declaration, July 4th, 1776. So, uh, you know, so, so there again, you see, he wants to fundamentally transform. He wants to transform. He wants to change what Reagan did. And in that sense, he wants to be a transformative leader like Reagan was a transformative leader. He wants to reverse what Reagan did. So a very different, uh, totally understand, uh, understanding by Obama. Uh, uh, on the score briefly, uh, I'll note uh, earlier this week, one of the headlines I read in the Wall Street Journal was that enrollment numbers for Obamacare were flat and were nowhere near uh, the anticipated uh, growth uh, for the next year uh, that that the government had wanted. So, it, in certain respects, uh, we we see Obamacare charitably put uh, a very mixed policy that that many people have just not not embraced anywhere near. Well, and, and, what, what, and, and Reagan wouldn't have been surprised. I mean, Reagan, in his time for choosing speech, October 1964, said that you know Americans realize. That, that when it comes to core functions, basic functions, we're outside of its core functions. Government does nothing as well or better than the private sector of the economy. And, uh, you know, Reagan understood that. And that's the kind of, um, I would say, common sense that progressives like Obama are constantly fighting against. And, and they eventually learn the lesson when 
free people in a free society turn around and reject this wondrous thing that, that Obama has, has offered to them. So, so Reagan would not, uh, Reagan, understanding human nature, and I would say understanding America, and both of those understandings are what conservatives are about, um, grasp that much better than, than Obama did or ever could. Uh, on the score, uh, something that I wanted to say, of course, uh, you know, briefly note, when we think about Obamacare, uh, the perception being this would be another great federal entitlement uh, along the lines of Social Security, Medicare, that Americans would glom onto and, and fiercely uh, protect and refuse to take any sort of cuts or retrenchment. Of course, we can note Ronald Reagan, as, as many of have, have observed, um, was not a president that wanted to roll back those, those fundamental entitlements. Growth in Medicare spending uh, was, in the single digits, it's probably the lowest it's been in the post, oh, since it's been enacted. Uh, so there's certainly th- that aspect of it. Uh, but this wasn't someone, this wasn't a president who thought his goal was to roll back the New Deal. Uh, and, and it also should be said that Obamacare passed uh, with only Democrat support, yet Reagan, the centerpiece of his fiscal policy, his tax cuts early in his administration had bipartisan support, and his budgets always had bipartisan support. Something that uh, you, you were talking about earlier is the, or you've been talking really throughout the interview, uh, Reagan's understanding of human nature and his understanding of the American mind. One of the things that I did in preparing for our interview was I went back and reread his farewell address uh, mm. from 1989. Uh, Great s- speech. Several things that, that stuck out. One is early in the speech he mentions um, a, a, an American uh, naval boat coming into contact with you know, one of the uh, you know, fleeing Vietnamese uh, boat people. And uh, you know, they, they take uh, the, the, these people, these poor, wretched people, on this boat on board. On, it was the Midway, um, was, was eventually where they ended up, the carrier Midway. And as, as they looked up from their, from their dinghy and they see the American Navy, you know, Reagan notes, they yelled, Hello, American sailor. Hello, freedom man. Hello, freedom man. Hello, freedom <laughs> man. I thought that these, these are the things uh, that, that Reagan noted. Um, something else, in referring to himself in, in the farewell address, he's, he refers to himself as, as he was given the name, the great communicator. And he says, right. I never thought it was my style or the words I used that made a difference. It was the content. I wasn't a great communicator, but I communicated great things and they didn't spring full bloom from my brow. They came from the heart of a great nation, yeah. from our experience, our wisdom, and our belief in the principles that have guided us for two centuries. Yeah, and the principles that have guided us for two centuries. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a kind of statement of conservatism right there. You know, Reagan gave this great speech way back in 1952, and it was to a tiny little all-women's college in Missouri called William Woods College. In fact, when I, when I called there, when I when I was writing God and Ronald Reagan over 10 years ago, and, and I asked them for a transcript of the speech, they were amazed that anybody even knew about it. <laughs> but, yeah. but, but Reagan Reagan had this great line there where he said, America is less of a place than an idea. America is less of a place than an idea. And, and, and it's true. I mean, you know, to be an American really, really means something. And, and it's, it's not the place of America that has attracted all those immigrants. That, that attracted the, uh, the Vietnamese boat person in the South China Sea who said, hello, freedom man. I mean, you could, there are all kinds of pretty places in the world. There's all kinds of beautiful geography in the world. You know, what, what compelled people like that boat person, the, the Cuban boat person that Reagan talked about in the Time for Choosing speech in 1964, what was America as an idea, and that idea is what made the place so attractive. And when, when, Ra- when Reagan said that, when he told that story in the farewell address in January of 1989, he said, he said, for me, it was a small moment, but, but it had a big meaning. And he said it was a moment that the sailor who wrote about it in a letter couldn't get out of his mind. And, and Reagan said, and then when I read it and I saw it, I couldn't get it, get it out of my mind either. And Reagan has a great line where he said, uh, I'm paraphrasing, something like, because that's what it was to be an American again in the 1980s. We stood for freedom. And so Reagan is there in a sense, you know, that's, that, that boat person is like a spokesperson 
for, for the shining city upon a hill, for America as an idea, not just a place. And Reagan himself was, was that spokesperson. So when he says, too, that you know, they call me the great communicator, but I was really communicating great ideas, yeah, that's true. But he was also a great communicator. So, so you know, he, he, he communicated, he greatly communicated the great ideas greatly. He did it very well. And, and it also helped with that speech to have the, the, the beautiful writing hand of Peggy Noonan, who, yeah. who, who wrote, a, wrote, a, wrote a beautiful speech there. But, it, but connecting this, maybe we should or shouldn't, to, to Obama, I can't imagine Barack Obama <laughs> giving a speech like that, right? Yeah. And, 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 and if he did, certainly not with the same feeling that, that, that when Reagan gave it, you knew he meant it. And, and when, when, Reagan, when Reagan did it, he had a tear in his eye and you had a tear in your eye. And, and we've, been, we've been missing that from the presidency, from either leader of either, either party, for you know, going on almost three decades now. Yeah, I, w- I would say, as you mentioned, Obama, were he to say such a thing, it would be preceded by half a dozen qualifications, <laughs> right. five, you know, four or five apologies. Um, yeah, yeah, who's to say that Vietnam isn't exceptional, yeah. just like Greece is exceptional, and uh, you know, the Vietnamese might think that they're exceptional, just like the Brits think that they're exceptional, and the Greeks think that they're exceptional, and you know, we all think that we're exceptional, too. There's another horrid o- o- Obama line where, speaking on July 4th a, a few years ago, he, he referred to the American founders as, as men of property and men of wealth. And <laughs> you would never... I, I did a study a, a, a few years ago on, on the number of times that, that, that presidents, recent presidents, have quoted the American founders. And, and you, you can track this now online and through a content analysis because the public papers of the presidents of the United States now go back online, well, not too far, at least 50 or 60 years. Uh-huh. And, and no president quoted the founders like Reagan. I mean, it was something like 900 times he had quoted Jefferson and, and Washington and, and Madison and Adams. And I think the next closest was Clinton at like 160, and Clinton was mainly quoting Thomas Jefferson and nobody else. But Obama hardly ever quotes the founders. And, and, and when he does, it, it's almost snide, dismissive comments like, American founding fathers, men of property and men of wealth. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't have that understanding, again, of America in, in, in a way that Reagan did and that Reagan could, could communicate when Reagan communicated, it, 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 it was almost an ongoing civics lesson for the country, um, one, one, that, one that, again, we've been missing now for three decades. Uh, we're thinking, you, know, you, you mentioned American exceptionalism, and of course, um, American exceptionalism can mean a, 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 a few different things. One of the things it didn't seem to mean, I think, for Ronald Reagan was uh, that it entitled America to use arms uh, in a very forward way, uh, and, and engaging in military projects for you know various abstract ends. It seemed to me Ronald Reagan had an idea of American exceptionalism, as you've noted, as an idea, but something that was exemplary, uh, that we we were called to be our best and to reflect that, and and others throughout the world w- w- would see it. That, that's how I understand Reagan's use of American exceptionalism, what he believed it was fundamentally about. Although uh, he obviously was, was willing to challenge the Soviet Union. And this kind of right. leads into my question, though. Uh, Reagan challenges the Soviet Union. Uh, one, he has, he has a fundamental conviction uh, that the realpolitik and the detente of Kissinger and Nixon uh, and others in, say, establishment foreign policy thinking was wrong. That is to say, to make your peace with the Soviet Union uh, was an error, and it was immoral, and to somehow guarantee them an ongoing existence uh, was wrong. And yet, that was the thinking of Kissinger. Uh, and Kissinger, some have said, I think with, uh, w- with great authority, even believed the Soviet Union had a better hand uh, than America. Th- I think. And so th- this is a part of what Reagan is repudiating. And yet, in that repudiation, I think... Reagan is willing to pull at the largest strings that are dangling from the Soviet Union 
and, and to nip at them in the ways in which they are exposed. So it's a pragmatic engagement uh, in terms of undermining the Soviet Union. And just like, as you note, in your essay, uh, uh, I, I think it was your essay in this book, on the Polish uh, question, where he, uh, you know, is also in, of one mind with, with the Pope at the time, John Paul II, that that was the area where the Soviet Union was weak uh, for a lot yeah. of reasons, and they could be turned back there and exposed internationally as a fraud. All of those sorts of ways, it seems to me uh, Reagan has a conviction, but there are ways in which he is going to pursue that. And we can talk about that in domestic policy as well, fiscal policy, uh, regulatory policy. He's, he's, he's always willing, it seems to me, contrary to, say, the, the caricature of Reagan, he's willing to maneuver. Uh, he's willing to adjust. And yet, it seems to me, after Reagan's departure from the scene, uh, and in particular, the Republican Party and the Conservative Party becomes committed to grand doctrines, whether that's democracy promotion and democracy building or, um, you know, unilateral assistance. The Republican Party is all about tax cuts or, or the, this sort of this sort of thinking. Uh, and, and they lose something. They lose something that Reagan had. And I think there's also this belief that comes to mind. When we think about the Cold War that that Reagan helps with other actors bring to an end is somehow we couldn't lose. Uh, we couldn't fail to lose the Cold War. Free markets were, of course, going to win. All of this forgetting that as, as Reagan came into office, no one believed that. And no one really believed that even probably in the mid to late 80s even. This, this was something that was nursed and brought about uh, through, through prudence and, and through conviction. And yet we all sort of now seem to think that, well, almost in a Marxist way, we couldn't fail to win. Uh, so all of these sorts of things we seem to have lost, and even people who are close to Reagan seem to have lost fundamental lessons that he was, you know, that his example gave. Well, sure. Yeah. And, and, and one of them in particular, you, you mentioned detente and, and, and Nixon and Kissinger, in fact, and even John Paul II. You know, John Paul II replaced, um, not immediately, but, but Pope Paul VI. Who Post-politique. Was politic, yeah, yeah, politique Pope. And, um, and Agostino Casseroli, who was Secretary of State, and, and who continued that position on with John Paul II. And, but, but John Paul II, like Reagan, you know, believed that you should not accept the, the, the detente ostpolitik status quo for, for the Europeans, because that was effectively uh, allowing your Eastern Central European brothers and sisters, and in John Paul II's case, Carol Wojtyla's case, literal brothers and sisters, you, you were selling them down the river. Uh, you you were accepting their slavery. You were you were giving them over to the Soviet Union. There's um, again a great line in Reagan's Time for Choosing speech, October 1964, where he said, and here too he's quoting another founder. He said, Alexander Hamilton warned us that a nation that prefers disgrace to danger is prepared for a master and deserves one. Mm-hmm. And 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 what he was arguing there is, um, in fact, I've got that quote. I'll read the rest of it. He's talking about choosing whether or not to confront the Soviets or basically accept their control of Eastern Europe. And he, and he continues that quote, immediately, admittedly, there is a risk in any course we follow. Choosing the high road cannot eliminate that risk. Should Moses have told the children of Israel to live in slavery rather than dare the wilderness? Should Christ have refused the cross? Should the Patriots of Concord Bridge have refused to fire the shot heard round the world? Are we to believe that all the martyrs of history died in vain? So <laughs> imagine yeah. anybody saying this today on, on television. But, but Reagan there is concluding that Americans have to choose courage over accommodation. Uh, they, you know, they, they've got to be willing to take on the Soviet Union. And, and he, he's telling Americans he and they have a rendezvous with destiny, uh, they, you know, they they could join him in in, in in trying to preserve this last best hope of man on earth, or sentence their children to to a thousand years of darkness. So so a you know, very dramatic language here. He, he's trying to frame uh, that that this is a choice between good and evil, and in choosing good and fighting against evil, you you cannot accept detente. You've got to be willing to take on the Soviet Union. Now, this, this didn't mean launching 10,000 nuclear missiles at the Soviets, but, but it did mean a military buildup, Reagan called this peace through strength, 
where where you could compel the Soviets to the negotiating table to reduce those armaments. He, he said, "There's no reason you're going to. There's no way you're going to get the Soviets to cut their arsenal if we're simply cutting what we already have. We've got to build up in order to build down. If you know, we we have to build and deploy 570." Euro missiles in Western Europe before we can get the Soviets to take their SS 20s out of Eastern Europe, and 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 so so yeah, that's what Reagan was doing with with the arms buildup, and also too Reagan believed that it, in defeating the Soviet Union and defeating it peacefully without going to war, this would advance. And I write about this in my my chapter in this this volume with Jeff Chidester. You, you could extend a march of freedom into the communist world, into Central and Eastern Europe that would be liberating and that would release those captive in the, in the captive nations. It would release the people of Poland and East Germany and Bulgaria and, and Hungary and, and Romania. Uh, so so you know, that was the grandiose Reagan vision. These were very high-minded ideas, I, I, ideals. It was it was an extremely optimistic view and, and, and belief in what he thought he could accomplish. And you and I lived through this, Richard. I mean, people listening now who are, who are younger, they, they, they can't imagine how, how Reagan was mocked and laughed at and dismissed for thinking, as he said in the Westminster Address in London, June 1982, that communism was about to fall in the ash heap of history. But, but just seven or eight years later, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, no, I mean, there's, I mean, I guess that's probably where, you know, I was, I was thinking or where I was going in, in my comments that somehow this, um, this sort of deterministic understanding now uh, that we have of communism, that we have of the Cold War, somehow seemed, uh, seems to license that we can somehow put this era away uh, and not keep thinking about, uh, you, know, you know, what, what precisely, no, not only was at stake, but what goes forward? Uh, what goes forward for statecraft? What goes forward for thinking of how to deal with uh, enemies uh, of America or those who are actively opposed uh, to what we stand for? And so, uh, you've got a chapter here on terrorism policy, which is interesting. It seems, to my mind, what I what I what I took from the chapter. Yeah, I think this goes back to Reagan's playing long ball with the Soviet Union. That's where, what he's concerned with. Uh, he confronts some pretty dramatic things, though, uh, when it comes to Islamic terrorism, uh, to hijacking of the TWA flight, uh, which which killed an American naval officer. The Marine barracks are bombed. 250 Marines die. We've got the arms for hostages, Iran-Contra crisis. Uh, it, it seems to me Reagan there, though, is is largely reacting uh, he's not exactly yeah. sure of of what to do, uh, right. and, and 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 it does. It seems you know what, what I took is it's not. It's really George Shultz who seems to sh- understand that uh, if you're going to defeat Islamic terror, you've got to be proactive. Uh, but of course, no one no one seemed to uh, arrive at uh, another set of conclusions of. You know how how one should actually do that, but it was just you needed to you needed to be more forward thinking, um, and it you know 2001 is is where all that changes, obviously. Well, yeah, and and the the chapter uh, that I did in the book on the march of freedom from Reagan to Bush, uh, George W. Bush comes up with an answer, or at least what he thinks is an answer, right? And and he says we're going to take Ronald Reagan's march of freedom, which Reagan successfully took into Eastern and Central Europe. And, uh, and, and, he, and he ties this to FDR during World War II, to Woodrow Wilson after World War I. Uh, you know, Bush sees this big picture of this long march of freedom where, where the world becomes more democratic, which it did. And, and you know, Reagan would cite the numbers from Freedom House on how a minority of countries in the world in the 1970s were considered, quote, unquote, democracies. And by 1992, um, a strong majority of, of the world's countries were considered democracies. And, and Bush, Bush was pointing all of this out in his, in his 2003 National Endowment for Democracy speech, where, where he's quoting Reagan's March of Freedom. Bush goes through all the numbers, all the different regions. And then Bush said, now the one region in the world that's been most immune to this, this tidal wave of freedom is the Middle East. 
and you know that that was one area where Reagan's uh, march of freedom did not extend. It didn't go into the Middle East. And Bush is right; he's got all of that exactly right. So then Bush said, "Now what we're going to do is we're going to extend that march of freedom into the Middle East, and, and specifically Iraq and Afghanistan. Now we're going to take it into what Bush called freedom's dungeon, precisely what the Middle East is. I mean, no other region in the world is so <laughs> absolutely." and totally undemocratic. And, and so Bush, Bush believing in this concept of democratic peace that Condoleezza Rice understood, um, this is a, a theory often taught in IR programs at, at universities, that the more democratic countries become, the, the less likely they are to go to war, which is largely true, but it depends on you know, what, what period of development the country is in democratically. But, but Bush said the way to bring peace into the Middle East, he believed, was, was, was democracy. You have to democratize it. And, and so that was the project that he embarked upon in the Middle East. Now, in theory, that, that's all quite eloquent and, and, and very nice. But, of course, the Middle East has never been democratic, and so you're embarking on something unprecedented. And, and we'd have to look at, at the project now, 12 years after that National Endowment for Democracy speech by Bush and say that it's not going very well. That when, when Reagan shared his vision of a march of freedom at Westminster in 1982, well, 12 years later, it was, it was accomplished. It was fully accomplished. You know, Reagan could witness it in his lifetime. Now, to be fair to Bush, Bush said that he didn't think he would ever live to witness it it in his own lifetime, and, and Bush left the presidency a much younger man than Reagan did. But, uh, but even then, it, it, it's hard to imagine Bush's march of freedom having the success in the Middle East that, that Reagan's did in Eastern Europe. Yeah, we could, I mean, we could talk about traditions of self-government in Eastern Europe, uh, because of cultural differences, obviously, religious differences. Uh, right. As you know, all, all sorts crucial. of these, all sorts of these things. I mean, and I, and I suppose that's what I keep getting at. You know, Bush had seemed to have this notion that we were somehow like linen uh, to globalism, global democracies, Marx or something like that. We could give it a shove and and bring it off and make it happen. And so he forgets what my friend Dan Mahoney uh, has said is that every or not every many human hearts might long for freedom. Uh, they don't exactly long for the preconditions to the rule of law, to limited government, uh, to humility about what government can do that actually makes democracy possible, right. to, to pluralism. All of these sorts of things are, are achievements that take a while to nurse, uh, to nurse along. And so that's, that's something that I, 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 th- I think where things may have just gone, seems to me something, something happened within the way a lot of our leadership thinks about American purpose and foreign policy after the Cold War was won. Uh, that's, that's just very strange. Um, thinking about Reagan here, we, we talked a lot about foreign policy. Uh, we, we talked about terrorism policy. Uh, something in uh, in your book that you know we've talked a little bit about here is this, this, the supply side economics. Uh, you know, incredibly high tax rates. The fundamental conviction of the supply sider was a dollar's worth of debt added was no big deal. Uh, it was acceptable, uh, and and it would be forgiven by an increase in economic growth. It seems to me that that makes sense when you have the tax rates Reagan inherited. It seems to me it, it doesn't really matter so much now, even though we're still we're hovering in the high 30s and all of that sort of business for for our top income earners. Uh, but capital gains taxes are pretty low uh, historically in in this country. Obviously, you know throughout the Western world, tax rates have come down dramatically, even if they're still higher and the continental Europe uh, uh, nations, um, but the supply side idea that was a huge that was a huge gamble Reagan took as well, and, and it seems to me it's largely largely stuck in the sense of low tax rates, uh, even though we're not exactly we're not exactly providing for the dramatic spending that we have. So that's maybe a tangled legacy in certain respects. Yeah, well, I mean the original Laffer curve, right? Art Laffer yeah. said that. That, I mean, you can you can cut taxes, but there you know there's a limit to how far you can tax you can cut them and when you can cut them. So you know, so at some point, so you can't just take them right down to zero. You can take them to a certain percentage. 
And and I and, and when and when Reagan did it worked. It, it clearly worked. And in, in fact, the uh, liberals will often say that that you know, there was a decline in tax revenue because of this. Well, there there wasn't. There wasn't at all. When when Reagan came in, there was about six hundred billion dollars a year in tax revenue to the Treasury. And when he left, it was about a trillion. So so there you know it, it increased significantly. And the only time. During the 1980s, when when there was a single year dip in those in those tax revenues, was was during the 82 83 recession, and uh, and recessions, I mean that's what causes a dip in tax revenue, and 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 that was the period when when the deficits under Reagan went up the most, um, also combined with increases in defense spending, in, in social spending by by liberals in Congress, uh, a lot of people don't realize the last two or three years. That the Reagan was president, the deficit actually came down, um, and and then and then really the key to to getting a complete balanced budget, and Bill Clinton was the beneficiary of this, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, by the early 1990s we were able to to literally cut a, a 300 billion dollar defense budget in half. Yeah. And, and if you're looking at, a, at, at Reagan left office with a deficit of about 153 billion, well, you know, if, if, it, if it was 300 billion a year and now the Soviet Union is gone and you can cut it to 100, you're going you're to balance the budget ju- just with that. I, I think it's interesting that Lou Cannon, the, you know, the first big Reagan biographer, Washington Post, White House correspondent, defends Reagan on this. He said, you have to look at the Reagan defense budget. As, as wartime budgets, because because he's using those to win a Cold War, to, to challenge the Soviet Union, to bring the Soviets to, to the negotiating table. And, and Cannon has said it worked. And, and when it worked, the 1990s, they were big beneficiaries. And as long as the economy was growing in the 1990s, with, which it did, you were going to balance the budget. And, 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 and really, we, we don't get back to deficits again. Now, here's where I think George Bush has been unfairly criticized. If, if, you, if you look at the early 2000s under Bush, those deficit numbers went up and down, mainly, mainly the, the, where we really lost the budget surpluses was with that 9-11 recession. I mean, that, that was devastating. And then the economy grew again, and there were tax cuts, and the deficit went up and down. It, it pretty much followed how the economy was doing, and also, too, how much money we were spending in the Middle East. So, so the, the, the Bush deficits, I don't think, can be blamed on tax cuts. And this goes, circles back to our original conversation. Obama and the progressives, they, they want to blame the Bush deficits on tax cuts. Uh, just like they wanted to blame the Reagan deficits on tax cuts. Now, they've been arguing this for almost 100 years, back to Andrew Mellon and the tax cuts in the 1920s under uh, Coolidge, Taft, and, 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 and Harding, the, the Republican president. Um, so I don't know, maybe I'm going in the wrong direction here, Richard. No, but, no. But, <laughs> no, no. But I, I, as... I guess it all relates. No, no, I, 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 I take your point. My, you know, I... I suppose, as we think about uh, Reagan's ability, really to, of course, I mean, I mean, I, I, as I, I think about this discussion, a lot of fast out comparisons could easily be made. I want to resist that. Uh, I, I suppose the problem now is we have not just deficits but structural debt. Uh, right. We have we have overhangs. We have big problems. We're lying to ourselves uh, about taxes and and entitlements. And and we're all sort of in on this. We're all sort of in on, um, you know, the average American gets a multiple of three or four in Social Security and Medicare uh, relative to what they actually put in. That's a bad thing, and that's kind of where we are. And so the, the maybe, yeah, yeah, the debt now is impossible. So the, yeah, right, the question I, I heard, is, is I heard, go ahead. Yeah, I heard uh, Donald Trump in an interview last week saying that it was actually conceivable at one point 20, 25 years ago that you could have gotten him and a few other billionaires together and, yeah. and asked them if they'd be willing to pay off the debt, and they could have probably done it. Uh, but, but we're now at the point where, where the debt is, is so deep into the multi-tens of trillions of dollars that, that it just it seems impo- unmanageable and impossible to, to even address it at this point. Yes, yes. Which... Especially through tax increases on anybody, let alone the rich. 
Yeah. No. And as I, you know, I think about this, you know, the, uh, you know, it's it's almost like, um, you know, conservatism obviously uh, is in a post Reagan direction. I I suppose though it's it's kind of like. You know, I'll, I'll make a facile comparison across the water. David Cameron wanted to be a post-Thatcher prime minister, and yet I think he's found out he needed to hew much more closer to her policies, uh, yeah. particular fiscal policies, than he perhaps wanted to. And I think, uh, in thinking about the Republican Party, the question is, well, what, what parts of the legacy, of the Reagan legacy, do we want to pack for the journey? Mm-hmm. And right. one, it seems one of those parts is is you, you want to stay close on on taxes, but you're going to need a Reagan-like unitive type effort to deal with entitlements. Um, and interestingly, Reagan, of course, famously you know got brought a lot of Democrats over on his tax cuts, but of course, different time, different era, a lot of different circumstances, a different Democratic Party, uh, et cetera. The right. Democratic Party that still had a lot of conservative Southern representatives. That uh, seems to me a huge part of that. So, so now if you're dealing with something that I think is, is a huge, I think a lot of people agree that the entitlement issue, you know, how, how, how to deal with that. And it seems to be Reagan would Reagan's pragmatism in pursuit of a grand vision would be one way to think about that. Um, on the regulatory legacy, uh, you don't address this in the book, and yet that's come up for criticism recently, particularly in the light of uh, President Obama's um, incredibly energetic use of executive branch powers or regulatory state powers to enforce his agenda uh, apart from Congress, um, even though the, the, the laws that authorize him to do that have been written by Congress, I should say. Uh, conservatives now, John Yoo most prominently, criticizing the regulatory strategy of the Reagan presidency because of its insistence upon keeping those federal agencies as independent as possible from Congress. I think under the under the strategic thinking that Republican presidents and Reagan was going to be in control of that, so it was fine, and it would result in more efficient policy making. And yet, uh, we're seeing that sort of boomerang. I think. Yeah, no, that, I, that that's probably right. And look on that. I mean, Reagan had mixed mixed success there too i mean yeah, again with the, the deficit almost doubled when when he was president although the understand uh, liberals often talk about it as if reagan invented deficits i mean he inherited a 79 billion dollar deficit from jimmy carter and we really started chronic deficits on, on, under fdr but the regulatory state really starting with woodrow wilson's administrative state and then going up through FDR, up through LBJ, and then I would even add Nixon to this with his agencies and departments, and then Carter with the Department of Education, for example. So Reagan gets in, and a lot of the problems that Reagan faced were that he wanted to change were almost intractable. Um, now, it, it, how, how do you quantify what he did? I mean, one way, there was the Federal Register, right? And people listening who don't know what that is, that's basically the official record or journal of the U.S. government's existing rules and regulations. So, I mean, this is this big, literal, massive official publication that, that's a collection of the record of, of federal regulations. And, and when Reagan came in in 1980, the Federal Register was 87,000 pages. Now, now by 1986, he had cut that to 47,000. So, so that that's a very significant cut. And again, remember this: you know, this, this is a list of rules and regulations. And so, it might seem like a kind of a simplistic way of, of measuring, but it's it's hard to quantify these things. So, if Reagan's cut the Federal Register, the the, the literal pages in half, 87,000 to 47,000. Then, then you know, that 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 was pretty good. And he 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 had he had a Republican Senate for a while until 1986, but he had an overwhelmingly Democratic House for for a long time. So, and, and in fact, one of the difficult things in speaking of Reagan and Reagan policy in the 1980s is, is because government was divided during that period really making things like Reagan's 81 tax cut all the more remarkable that he pulled that off. But, but, but it's hard often to um, 
credit Reagan with what some people would like to credit him with and at the same time criticize him for what people like to criticize him with because there's divided government. So Reagan can't always totally get what he wants. So, so a conservative could look back at the deficits of the 1980s and, and, and blame it on uh, spending by liberals in Congress. Um, a liberal can go back and, and blame the deficits on Reagan's tax cuts. Uh, but but with with federal regulations and the regulatory state, uh, Reagan 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 had I think some uh, at least some decent success there. Yeah, no, I mean I, I as I listen to you talk, I mean we can imagine if if you really want to get at the problem of the regulatory state, it, it seems to me, and we're we're starting to see a lot of literature emerge on that in the past few years. I think occasioned by what Obama's been doing. Uh, you know, Richard Epstein had the famous essay, Government by Waiver and National Affairs, that got a lot of attention. Uh, but others now focusing their attention here on this problem, and it's it's congressional problem, and it's a problem of what is designed to be the, 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 the first branch, uh, relinquishing its authority and choosing instead to be a manager, it seems to me, of the regulatory state. So as, as opposed to a deliberative body actively taking responsibility. And so if, if you look at Reagan's position, I can see what you're saying. If you really want to get at a problem of the regulatory state, that sort of root and branch approach isn't going to work. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to insist upon a, a, an aggressive approach of political appointees trying to, trying to impose discipline, I guess. Well, it's, and, and it's going to be so much more difficult for whoever comes in yeah. next because... I mean, the, the main job growth that's taken place over the past seven years under Obama has, has been in federal jobs. Yes. And, and you know, those, those folks, among other things, they, they flooded northern Virginia. Was well, the wealthiest to, county in the country, right? Uh, right, right. Two, two wealthiest to counties, in, yeah. Yeah, I used to live in that area. It's become a boom town. There are so many people in that area now that have come in that are now working for the government in unionized positions that I think this is basically going to turn Virginia politically into another Maryland. I don't know if Virginia will ever vote Republican again, um, given all the massive numbers of um, federal <laughs> employees that, that have been shipped in there the past seven years. But, but, but the, these folks are not just federal employees. They are unionized federal employees through AFSCME, the SEIU, which are also very political and very politically active unions. So my, my point with this is, is all of that, the unionization and of, of this, this massive increase in federal jobs is going to make the ability to shrink the government, reduce agencies, even reduce the rate of growth in these agencies and departments extremely difficult. For, for any future president, party, uh, whatever. And, and that'll be one of the, I think, frankly, that's one of those areas of fundamental transformation that, that Obama has slowly mm -hmm. pulled off that, that doesn't strike the common person or even uh, the common policy wonk. Right? This is something that um, has slowly but surely taken place under two terms of Obama. No, it, it seems yeah that, that that's right. Uh, Obama uh, Obama realized the regulatory state had latent power that wasn't being exercised and which really couldn't be resisted uh, effectively. And he also realized corporations were incredibly amoral, and if you could promise them guaranteed profits in various ways through go government contracts, uh, they would be sure. your best advocates. And and he succeeded there with with some of his policies. Um, so that's depressing, Paul. <laughs> and, it's all depressing. And I, 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 I don't want to end on a depressing note uh, necessarily. <laughs> uh, that'll, that'll be hard. Although maybe maybe we will because I, I wanted to end. Uh, we haven't even the, talked about culture. I don't even want to go there. Well, well, well maybe that's another podcast. Uh, there's a lot. Of, there's a there's a lot there, and uh, our shovel is small. Um, on on this farewell address, Reagan ends about you know kind of recounting. Uh, I think it's fair to say uh, you know, an American Renaissance uh, that he helped start. Uh, particularly uh, economic policy, we've been talking about foreign policy, but Americans gaining a renewed sense of confidence in their country, and he recounts that, uh, moves away from taking credit for it. And he, he recalls, though, American patriotism being, and I guess this is important, 
as as we were saying at the beginning of this interview, America being an idea. So our patriotism is always about memory, and mm. and memories of ideas and keeping ideas alive. And he quotes a young woman who sent a letter to him. Her father had died in Normandy. And, oh, yeah. and the letter, the letter to Ronald Reagan from from this young woman, quote, we will always remember, we will never forget what the boys of Normandy did. Reagan's reflection on that is we're losing our American memory and we're, we're losing something uh, central to our country and we've got to recover it. And he mentions uh, that you could breathe it in once. Now you no longer can breathe it in. Uh, I, and I, I had forgotten that in the farewell address. Mm-hmm. I, I was interested. I'm interested to get your thoughts on that because it seems to me that's only gotten worse. And in many ways, now we've institutionalized uh, multiculturalism, and we've institutionalized a identities uh, of Americans. We no longer are emphasizing that this is a nation of election and chosenness to become something else that you become an American because you accept something uh, it's it's now caught up with a thousand different identities and that seems to me uh, Reagan sent something he was right and how we put that back together is yet another problem well that's right yeah he quotes Lisa Zanata that's such a great speech and and he also says there too that he, he says all great change in America begins at the dinner table and, and so he tells the children of America that the next night when they're at dinner with their parents, you know, tell them what it means to be an American, right? And, and if, your par- if your parents aren't teaching you what it means to be an American, then Reagan says, let them know about it and nail them on it. He, you know, he says with you know, kind of classic Reaganism, that would be a very American thing to do. You know, Reagan there, I think, is wistfully thinking back to it to his own youth in the 1920s in Dixon, Illinois, sitting at the table with his brother Neil and his mom Nell and his father Jack, and they had those kinds of conversations. And, and, and Reagan's mom, Disciples of Christ denomination, very devout. His father, Jack, um, Catholic, but, but not a very devout Catholic. But they would go to the American Legion. They would, they would hear lectures on Washington and on Lincoln, so, so, you know, for Reagan, those conversations at the dinner table, they were very American. They, they were very positive. You, know, you, you learn what it meant to be an American. But the problem today, and, and I think this is what you're alluding to, Richard, maybe, is, is that what would those conversations even look like at the table today in, in, in a modern America where Americans don't even know what it means to be an American, where, um, you know, there, there is a rejection of the idea of um, preserved values, of first principles, of eternal absolutes, of what life itself means, of what liberty means, of what marriage means. You know, all of these things to modern young Americans are up to redefinition. Again, what Justice Anthony Kennedy said, you know, liberty is the right to come up with your own meanings of meaning. So, so you know, those dinner conversations today would be, um, would be very depressing. And I know you wanted to end on a... <laughs> <laughs> on a high note, but, but this is why, uh, unfortunately, me, the scholar of Reagan, I find it hard to share Reagan's optimism, because um, we're living in such a different America now than what he had in the 1980s. But, uh, but Reagan believed in education, in civic education, teaching Americans what it means to be an American. And so I guess maybe um, that's what our task is today, that no matter how depressing it is, how hard it is, you know, we still have to teach Americans that America is less a place than an idea, and we have to teach them what that idea is. Paul Kingor, thank you so much for your time. We've been talking with the co-editor of Reagan's Legacy and a World Transformed, Paul Kingor. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Richard. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.